Well, I suppose we've all got different species of fish that rank amongst our favourites. And one of mine, if not my favourite, has to be Big Rudd. They're not the biggest of fish, of course, but they are amongst the most beautiful. And they're generally pretty rare as well. They're not that difficult to catch, to be honest, if you can find a venue that's got good numbers of them in it. But uh, the tactics do vary quite a lot. So I thought this week we'd take a look at uh, some of the places I've fished over the years for Big Rudd. And I've been lucky to find a few venues with some really, really big fish in and the kind of tactics that I've used, which have really varied depending on the behaviour of the fish. So give us a subscribe if you like these videos, and let's crack on and uh, talk about some of the rub fishing I've had down the years. Wow, well, I don't remember catching any rudd when I was a youngster. And it was really uh, a chance discovery back in the mid-1990s that put me on the trail my first Big Rudd. I'd um, been invited as a guest for a night on a little carp syndicate over in East Anglia and uh, we were carp fishing but uh, during the day I had a walk around and there was a little bay that you couldn't fish and in there was quite a few carp as you'd expect but amongst them was some massive massive rudd. Um, I really hadn't ever seen anything like it before in my life. The water on this little pit was absolutely gin clear and you could see every scale on these rudd. They were literally only 10 feet away from me, but of course, in a spot where you couldn't fish for them. So that was that. Not that I could anyway. All I had with me was my carp gear, so it wouldn't have really been uh, very sporting. But of course, it was, it was a small syndicate, and I got my name down on the uh, waiting list as quick as I could. Made it clear that I didn't want to fish for the carp as well. All I was really interested in was those rudd. And as I, as I recall, I think there was only one other guy on the syndicate who had much of an interest in them. Now it took three years for that ticket to come through but eventually it did and the, the card fell through my letterbox. Unfortunately where before I'd only been living about half an hour from the lake now my letterbox was in the lake district which on a good run was about five hours drive down to this lake but still um, the thought of those big rudd still uh, it was incredible still kept me going and I thought if the ticket comes up, it's such a rare ticket to be offered that uh, I needed to grab it with both hands. And it wasn't really until late, very late in the year that I managed my first trip down there. In fact, it was the week before the frosts, which was going to have a big impact on the fishing on there, but um, I didn't know that at the time. I decided to go down for two nights um, over a weekend and uh, give it my best shot. I hadn't had a chance to do any preparation at all. It was going to be a question of just really learning as we went along. And the first night was pretty quiet. I had a few small rudd, up to about half a pound and a few perch, but nothing, uh, nothing spectacular. To be honest, by the time I'd driven down there and got my, my you know, camp sorted out, I was really knackered. And it was just a question of putting the rods out and letting them fish for themselves that first night and then really get some kip and then see how it went on the second day. Now I had a walk around the next morning and on the first lap didn't really see very much, it was still quite early and uh, the bay where I'd seen all the fish before was pretty much devoid of anything. Um, but I saw a few carp tucked away in corners and thought well, I might have a go for them on you know, stalking tactics later in the day if nothing else appeared. And I thought well there's no point in, in fishing uh, and not knowing where the fish are, it's not. It wasn't a massive lake, it was probably only about eight, eight acres, but plenty big enough to be a long, for me to be a long way from the fish if uh, they were shoaled up in one area. So after breakfast, I thought, well, I'm just going to keep walking around the lake and looking, uh, the Polaroids on. The water was, again, incredibly clear, some of the clearest water I've ever seen in a gravel pit. So it was a, a question of just walking. Now, by oh, probably by about 10 o'clock, I'd done two or three laps. And every time I walked past the no fishing bay, there was a few more fish in there. They'd started to appear. And by lunchtime, it was round with fish again. Quite a, a big proportion of the, the lake's carp stock were in there. They weren't big fish, up to about 30 pounds. But again, amongst them were my targets, these big rudd. And they just appeared out of nowhere. And there they were. And it was a good opportunity. Um, I needed to move swims because I wasn't anywhere near them. Um, and I thought my best opportunity is going to be to try and fish on the patrol route as they're moving in and out of that bay. But in the meantime, I thought, well, I'll try some different baits on them and uh, see what they like. So I could try and 
at least get an idea for tactics for that evening. So I walked around with a bag of boilies and a mixture of 10 and 15 millimetre bait, some bread, uh, some floating pellets, sweet corn, all the normal stuff really. And to be honest, whatever I threw in was demolished. There was a lot of fish there now and uh, those rudd, even though they really, really struggled to eat a 15 millimetre boilie, as you can imagine, they'd still play football with it and uh, the odd one would get snaffled by the really big fish, but most of them would just get knocked around for ages before they settled on the bottom and the carp ate them. Certainly 10, 12 millimetre boilies, no problem at all. Big lumps of flake, no problem. Uh, floating pellets, they'd come up and take those. So they were switched on to most things. Certainly you know, they would eat bait and that wasn't going to be a problem in catching them. So one thing I did notice there was that any bait that did get onto the bottom, they really struggled to pick up. They'd almost have to turn on their sides to, to get uh, into the right position to pick it up and certainly they much prefer baits that are up in the water or even falling through the water or suspended was made life so much easier for them. So that afternoon uh, packed all the gear up chucked it back in the car and drove around to a swim that uh, was as close to the to the fish as I could get really and I thought it would give me a good chance of uh, intercepting them as they moved in and out of the bay. Now when I say it was a swim it was actually more like a cliff face it was a sandy bank, probably about 20 foot, 25 feet high. And uh, every time I tried to get move up and down it, the whole bank would slide down on top of me as it was so sandy and dry. But eventually I managed to kick a platform just wide enough for my chair and a couple of rods. And uh, that was going to be me for the evening. So got the rod sorted out and I thought, well, my best bet is to, going to be to fish almost parallel with the bank and uh, intercept these rod as they were moving in and out of this bay. And like, again, I could stand on top of the bank and see through the Polaroids that there was a big bar that stretched down the center of the lake. And it just either side of it was fairly clear of weed, whereas if you went much further, the weed got really bad. And so that's where I put the rods, one either side of that bar. Um, again, something I should mention that the lake was crammed full of small rudd and uh, certainly any bait that you put in, again, they play football with it, rigs would get tangled and single bits of sweet corn, bunches of maggots would just be eaten straight away and you'd be pestered, you'd be constantly trying to catch, or constantly catching small fish. So again I thought, I've seen these, these big rud eat a relatively big bait, that's going to be my approach. So it was, forget the maggots, forget the worms, you're not going to get through the small fish with those, on with the boilies and in particular some 12 millimetre pop-ups that I had with me, that was going to be my approach. Um, marked up the lines, got a nice drop on both of them, so I knew I was fishing a relatively clear area. And uh, then it was just a case of waiting, really. And um, it was on with cage feeders filled with really, really dry, almost you know, almost dry ground bait, um, an explosive feeder mix. And I'd recast regularly just to try and keep a bit of bait up in the water column, just to hold any fish or attract any fish that came past from anywhere near where I was fishing. And I had nothing in the afternoon, cooked some tea and uh, had, had my dinner and then concentrated on the fishing. I was recasting each rod probably about every 15 minutes. So I'd do one, give it five minutes, do the other rod and keep doing it. Just keep a bit of fresh bait going in. I didn't want to put too much out. I knew there was a lot of fish in the bay, but how many were going to come past me, I really didn't know. So it was uh, just a question of suck it and see really. As the light started to fade, I started getting a few indications and then we were away. The first one pulled the bobbin up to the top. Oh, is that? A... Yeah, it's definitely on. Played it in so, so gingerly. It was a long trip. It was it cost me quite a bit of money to go and fish there. A lot of time. I really didn't want to lose it. And by now I had a head torch on. It rolled and went into the net. Didn't fight too hard, to be honest, on, on the ledger gear at sort of 50 metres I was fishing at. And it was a fish. But eventually I weighed it and it was uh, about two and a half pounds. But before I had a chance to do that, actually the other rod was away and uh, played that one in and ended up with two in the net. And this one was appreciably bigger and it was a 212. And that was it. That was the only two bites I had. The fish had come through, and, you know, literally that I think the whole shoulder come through as one, moved out into the main body of the lake. I'd just been lucky enough to pick off two fish as simple as that. Very, very lucky. Um, 
it gave me a great incentive for uh, to keep the ticket and to come back some more but unfortunately uh, the frost came early that that year and the next week it was forecast to be really cold and i thought that's it i'm gonna leave it till the next year and then have a proper go when there's a bit more time and that's what i did so year two i was back and this was going to be my year i was going to uh, try and fish the lake as much as i could which probably only accounted for about six or seven trips in a whole year but that was obviously a lot more I'd done before and it gave me a chance to, to refine the tactics a little bit and probably in retrospect make a couple of big mistakes as well but we'll talk about them in a minute. So it was pretty obvious and I got this idea in my head that the fish would spend a lot of the day in the no fishing bay but then come out into the lake and uh, patrol off wherever they went at night and I thought well I'm going to try putting more bait out and uh, try and hold the fish for a bit longer and also another critical thing was I always took a couple of spare rods with me as well had them rigged up ready baited so as soon as I had a fish in the landing net I'd leave it there let it rest put a rod out straight away on the same mark and so so often that uh, meant I, rather than catching one or two fish I'd catch three or four as the shoal moved through and it really would be as quick as that very often you know I was making all that journey and then I'd have three or four quick bites in the evening maybe one or two at first light um, but the rest of the time would just be stalking carp and uh, mooching around looking for the fish and, and experimenting with the ones that were in the bay um, and most of the fishing again was at fairly long range those those rudd they certainly knew where the clear spots were that um, the carp had cleared and uh, that the carp anglers were baiting regularly so it really paid to kind of fish those areas that had been Sort of inadvertently pre-baited for them really and that uh, was the tactics I used it was pretty simple really um, it was a helicopter rig but kind of a different one to what we use for most species really and again learning from that first first observations in that first year and how difficult the rudd found it to pick up baits off the bottom I modified the, um, the helicopter rigs to present a bait anywhere from about six inches to three or four feet off the bottom really to try and put it in a position where it's so easy for the rod to feed so I'd start off with a feeder and have the uh, the float stops for the helicopter only a few inches away from it because the idea was that would be filled with ground bait that was almost dry and um, I'd put desiccated coconut in it and small floating pellets anything that as the ground bait broke down in the feeder uh, would start to float up and keep the attraction going and then a long hook length and say anywhere between six inches and several feet and again with a small pop-up on the end and so the idea being that the feeder obviously comes to rest on the bottom and then the hook length is right up in the water column perfect position to catch a rudd just where we want it right up in the water it really worked a treat um, I caught fish on most of those trips the second year um, several three pounders lots of two pounders uh, it really was unbelievable fishing um, several times I had braces of three pounders um, absolutely exceptional fish probably never really caught the biggest ones um, eventually my PB crept up a little bit by an ounce or two um, every couple of trips and it got up to about three pounds six ounces on that second year big big fish a um, bit unfortunate that I was having a fish to feed for them at quite long range because it wasn't ideal especially as the lake was full of this uh, pot McGeaton weed which were growing anything up to 16 foot water and was really really tough the local anglers called it kelp weed and so it was a question of every time I hooked a rudd was to get the rod up and walk back try and get the fish to lift up in the water play them quite hard to keep them out of this weed and stop them getting bogged down but it was, it was exceptional fishing to be honest I think the mistake I, I did make was that I probably could have caught more fish on the float but the, um, the problem was I was getting down there and, and, and was in such a, a panic to fish and quite tired even by the time I just arrived after the long drive that I tended to stick with the tactics I knew and that were working rather than go off and do more stalking around some of the deep margins and the reed beds it was just easier to carry on doing what was working for me so that's what I did now by the third year um, jobs had changed and I'd actually moved back to East Anglia again so 
now I was only probably an hour or so away from the lake and again it allowed me to experiment a lot more. I caught quite a lot of fish and the tactics were working but I wanted to try and see if I could catch them off the top and uh, try and catch them closer in on the float and I'd often go up even though it was still quite a long drive I'd often go up just for those evening spells uh, with a float rod or some floater gear and try and catch them and they proved quite tricky to be honest certainly they would come up and feed quite uh, well very very enthusiast enthusiastically on floating pellets but trying to catch them was another thing in, entirely they could obviously see the hooks and the line in that gin clear water and it made them really really difficult to catch off the surface it also um, really highlighted and, and proved what i'd thought about how quickly these shoals of rod were moving around because i bait 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 really really heavily with these small floating pellets on the top and you watch the rud some evenings come out of the, of the no fishing bay move down the lake and they'd hit the pellets demolish them you know, even though i'd put out probably half a kilo of bait and not even stop they'd be like little piranhas going across and uh, you just couldn't stop them with any amount of bait it was just a matter of making the best of the opportunity you could and that would be it so it was by the end of that third year i've really got it sussed i think i've learned a lot um, I knew how to catch them. When I did get them feeding on the floating baits, in the end what I'd do is fish a big waggler um, with a slow sinking piece of flake on, cast it out, draw it back in amongst them and you'd get a bite straight away as the bait fell through the, the water column. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and I was loving it, loving it. And that third year PB went up a couple more ounces to £3.8 ounces, but every time I spoke to the carp anglers they were all catching four pounders and uh, so there was definitely fish in there bigger than what I caught, even if their scales were perhaps uh, not that accurate at times. But as all good things, it had to come to an end and um, it was a bit of a sorry tale really. Um, at the end of the year, the uh, syndicate lost the fishing on the lake. It was used for other sports as well. And uh, so we lost it and uh, that was that. No opportunity to go and fish there. I, I approached the owner see if uh, you know anything else was happening but he just didn't want any fishing on there anymore and so that was that fishing gone